Great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I think we're actually going to show an animation first. Yeah. Education is crucial. It has the power to break the cycle of poverty and paves the way to a better quality of life for all. World leaders and national governments alike have recognized its importance. A comprehensive agenda known as Education for All set the ambition for global progress, while the Millennium Development Goals focus greater attention on achieving universal primary education and creating a level playing field between girls and boys. Since 1990, the proportion of primary age children in developing countries who are out of school has halved and an additional 120 million children have enrolled. Huge improvements have also been made in getting girls into the classroom. Some countries have made gains in particularly challenging areas. Good quality education is an important piece of the puzzle in reaching other development goals, yet it can be hard to achieve. Reforms in Chile, driven by strong public demand, a willingness to experiment, and the building of political consensus, have made it a regional leader in the quality of basic education, although inequalities persist. Indonesia is also raising the bar on quality, strengthening its teaching force, reforming the curriculum, and targeting funds to the poor through cash transfers and scholarships. More children than ever are completing a good primary education in these countries and elsewhere. But greater progress is needed to extend transition to secondary and tertiary levels, with hopes of enabling access to better jobs. Only two in three children in developing countries were enrolled in secondary school in 2011, and under one in four in tertiary education. And yet in Mongolia, although a pupil was only expected to stay in school for eight years in 1994, by 2010 this had nearly doubled to 14 years. Strong public demand, a transition economy, and increased government investment helped to expand access for those previously excluded. Kenya also increased the number of years children spend in education as a result partly of election promises to abolish school fees and a new constitution that embedded the right to education for all. While these experiences show promise, there are challenges ahead. Too many children are excluded from school, others still do not learn the basics or enter higher levels of education, and progress hasn't happened for everyone. More needs to be done to help the poorest and support students leaving school to find work. As new ambitions to deliver good quality education for all are set, we must learn from and build on the progress of the last decades. To find out more, visit developmentprogress.org. Right, so that gives you a little bit of a taster of, of some of um, what we've been trying to look at and, and some of the specific countries that uh, we've been looking at in this research as well. Um, what I wanted to do now is to um, give you an overview first of what we're doing with the development project as a whole and then um, a highlighting what we've done in terms of education. So um, development progress is um, it's a project that came out of really the, the period around the midterm of the MDGs. Um, and there was a lot of negativity happening at, at that time around development, a, a feeling that we're not going to be reaching these goals and, and press attention to that. Um, and a, a number of people, um, including some of the leadership here at ODI, we're, we're trying to, to think what to do about that. And the fact was that, that that's not the full story. There's a lot of progress that is happening in development um, that goes beyond what the MDG goals are. And it's not um, easily accessible to, to a lot of people, those stories of progress. Um, and so can we do some further research and, and put together examples of, of where changes have happened and, and improvements. Um, so there was a first phase of development progress um, that, f that developed 24 case studies, of which uh, there were a few in education, and I'll mention those. Um, but then uh, we've moved on to a second phase of the project, um, and we're doing a, a further 
20 plus case studies that are a bit more in depth um, and include a greater focus on looking at the measurement side of things, looking at political economy issues, and looking at financing. Um, and we, we're also um, going beyond that to um, have a big focus on communication. So it's not just about doing the research and putting the stories together, but how do we get them out there um, and, and out there uh, in more accessible ways? Thus, things like the animation. Um, and it'd be great for, for you to share that on social media networks, get that out to people. Um, we're looking at eight different dimensions of progress or sectors um, through the project. Uh, education is one of those. Um, over uh, the next six months, um, the remainder of our, our case studies in this second phase will come out, um, and we'll have nearly 50 case studies of progress across these range of sectors, um, a, a kind of library of, of stories of progress, if you will. Um, from that, we're going to be moving on to, to really focus on how can some of these lessons be learned, be used in terms of post-2015 implementation. As new goals are set, what can we learn from how change has actually happened on the ground and, and apply that um, in new contexts as, as plans are put together to move towards new goals. So, in terms of, of education and development progress, in the first phase, um, we looked at three case studies um, that were very much focused on, on access. Um, Benin, Cambodia, and Ethiopia. Access at, at primary education level. And that included um, examples of, of how in Ethiopia, there had been a 500% increase in enrollment between 1994 and, and 2009. And lots of other parts of that story were quite important. Um, what we wanted to do in this second phase was to move beyond looking at, at universal primary enrollment as, as an area to focus on some of the areas that are likely to, to need and, and uh, sit within the post-2015 goals related to education. So um, we've looked at post-primary education in a couple of countries that have made some progress um, on uh, expanding access in particular um, to secondary education and to some extent to tertiary. And a couple of countries that um, have, have shown improvements in quality. So I'll tell you a little bit more about how we went through the selection process for that as well. Um, we did a, a fair amount of data analysis looking at key indicators around school life expectancy, um, quality improvements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we talked to a number of experts um, in the field, tried to get some of their ideas of, of where strong stories were. And we, um, we also were looking at a balance of context. So there were a number of, of these other sectors that we're doing case studies in, and we needed to balance it across all of those. And so we've ended up with um, a uh, case studies looking at post-primary education in Mongolia and Kenya and improvements in quality in Chile and Indonesia. So a couple of the uh, highlights in terms of um, what we found uh, and, and why we're looking at these. So as I said, we, we did some analysis particularly around school life expectancy but also around a number of enrollment related, in completion and enrollment related indicators. Um, we looked at those for uh, the post-primary education case studies, but to a certain extent for the quality ones as well, because we wanted to make sure that there had been um, ongoing gains in, in terms of access. Um, school life expectancy is largely um, an indicator that relates to those in school um, and, and improvements there, and so we also were looking at a range of um, enrollment data and went through a process of um, analyzing this against a deviation from fit methodology. So countries looking at their starting point on some of these indicators and what their pathway had been um, against like countries, both in terms of income and in the region. So we've ended up uh, with, um, with improvements like what we saw in Mongolia, and you'll hear a bit more about that, where 
um, school life expectancy almost doubled um, over a period of um, from 1994 to 2010. Um, we also uh, looked at selection around um, quality improvements. This was much more difficult to um, both to be uh, identifying and, and using data that, uh, that could tell us about improvements in quality. There's very limited comparable data out there beyond the, the PISA and TIMS assessment tests. Um, so we looked at those. Um, we also tried to look at national assessments, where they were available. Um, but then we also went beyond that to look at where there had been major initiatives um, around improvements in quality. Um, it was very difficult to um, feel comfortable, find, find these case studies on improved quality at a national level and feel comfortable that, that we really were telling a story of progress. And you'll hear a bit more about the nuances in that when you, you hear about Chile and some of the, the improvements seen there against a situation where there's, there's still great inequities um, versus Indonesia where there, um, the, the improvements in learning, there's been a major initiative on improving quality and then a major initiative on, on teacher uh, development in particular, but how that's translated into learning outcomes is still somewhat questionable. Um, and then finally, just to say, we also looked um, slightly at uh, education financing, although that was looked at a little bit more after selection of countries um, and as we looked into the case studies. And it was, um, e each of the case studies that we have done um, have uh, have been meeting their targets around 20% uh, of budget expenditure on education or are close to that. Um, and they've also seen large um, increases in, in financing uh, for education due to growth. Um, going to give you a quick whistle stop tour of some of the things that have driven progress in the different countries. And I'm going to be very brief on this because we've got speakers that are going to talk, to talk about that um, in more detail. But in Mongolia, um, it was really a combination of um, strong demand um, coming off of uh, the, the, um, the breakup of the Soviet Union and, and some dips in what had happened there on um, enrollment and education, um, expanded provision to rural areas, um, and a huge increase in, in number of teachers and, and attention to um, both primary and secondary education. Um, in Kenya, some of the key drivers, again, um, demand is, is a major driver, and there's a hi strong history of community provision um, and community contributions to education through the Harambe movement there that, that have helped spur that on, um, alongside uh, school fee abolition, both at the primary and secondary level, um, and a major political platform for education. Um, in Chile, uh, a focus on um, teacher upgrading has been um, a major part of the story, the driving progress, um, and an emphasis, a political emphasis on quality and a, a joining of the PISA and TIMS and real concern from a political perspective of, of where Chile was ranking on those, so a big effort on quality resulted from, a, from that. And then finally in Indonesia, um, a, a focus on um, teacher upgrading, teacher certification has been a big driver, decentralization, and um, some really interesting work on targeted support to more marginalized children that actually, in, in a few cases, has seems to link to improved learning outcomes. So those quick whistle-stop tour of some of the, the drivers that we've found. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to highlight is a paper that we've done um, looking across these case studies and beyond on the political dynamic that have looked at the political dynamics that have um, driven progress in education. And we were uh, started to ask the question, well, why is it that it seems that there, there has been so much progress on access and it, it's quite difficult to gain traction on improving quality? Um, and so as we um, examined some of those questions, 
what we've found is there, there really seems to be a perfect storm um, between global goals that uh, emphasize access and a number of domestic incentives in, in many countries that favor a focus on access over quality. And that's driven by things like politicians prioritizing visible outputs um, because they offer higher political returns. An example is in Kenya where the, the political platforms um, and, and the elections have been focused on increasing enrollment through fee abolition. Um, an, another major factor is that it's actually quite hard for parents, communities, uh, and others to monitor quality, to know that that's um, happening and, and improving. Um, in Indonesia, we'll hear a bit more about how that is a challenge. Um, and it's often easier for parents and students to, to opt out. Um, and there's a number of examples of countries where um, private sector education is growing. Um, and that's, that's um, because of, of this lack of um, ability to mobilize and build coalitions around education quality. So just two more quick slides, um, just to say, we're very aware these case studies are not um, success stories. They're stories of progress. So I think there is, we're, we're exploring the country situations at a particular moment in time where there's been gains, but there's, there's more to be done. Um, and then some of the major issues that, um, and challenges that have come out across the case studies center around political dynamics, which I just mentioned, equity, um, which inequity is, is becoming entrenched in systems because of how they're structured. And I think both Chile and Kenya have some elements of that in particular. Um, and then linking inputs, is including finance, to learning outcomes and, and the real challenges in that. So um, just to uh, briefly thank some of the people involved in these case studies, there's been a number of ODI researchers, um, and, and you'll hear from some of them today. Um, local consultants from the countries who have been involved in, um, in the research and, and at times writing, and a number of peer reviewers, um, and, and you'll be hearing from many of them today as well. So thank you very much. Susan, thank you. That was great.